Hey everyone, a year ago seems like a very different world. There was no coronavirus apart from inside that Chinese laboratory. Prince Harry was still fairly popular. And a lot of folks were just wishing that the news would stop talking about Brexit. Most notably, the politicians trying to stop it. Most were just thinking they could delay and delay and grind and wear the public down until they eventually tired of the idea and forgot about the whole thing. Like when we gave Robert Mugabe a knighthood. Whoops. And that time that brilliant actor Michael Caine decided to star in Jaws 4. Ugh. Anyway, along with the people's vote ultimately being as popular with the general public as that shark-related mess of a film, it looks like Brexit will finally be going forward at the end of the year and very possibly under WTO rules, which is more than anyone who voted Leave ever thought possible. Strange as it seems, it was ultimately people like Tony Blair and Ken Clark that directly facilitated Brexit by preventing Theresa May's fake deal being passed. Talk about shooting yourself in the foot, Tony, or the suede loafer in the case of Clan Clark. Theresa May's deal, we were told at the time, was a national suicide note. Not being in the EU would apparently bring about the end of the world, or at least the part of the world not lining up to form a National Armed Forces headquartered in Brussels, and presumably managed by whoever can still correctly identify the Sudeten land on a map after two bottles of claret. Nonetheless, there have been a number of very positive economic stories this year about what the post-Brexit financial landscape will look like, not that you'd hear about them much in the news, so I thought I'd mention them here this week. Number one, Unilever. This was a massive story in 2019 after the company initially said that they'd relocate to Rotterdam to remain in the EU. Then it turned out that the shareholders would have to have a say in the whole thing and ultimately the company therefore concluded that they'd restructure themselves to be based in London and not the EU. And for Remainers, this was the sort of U-turn equivalent to that time that Napoleon, quote, changed his mind about invading Russia. There was, of course, next to no mention of that part of the story, the moving to the UK part, at least until the Dutch government said that they'd create a law forcing the company to pay an 11 billion euro exit tax if they moved to the UK. This was very quickly twisted and turned around by some, though, and respun as a case of a British company being forced to spend billions of euros all because of Brexit, rather than the case of what it is. It's a company potentially choosing to spend 11 billion euros and relocate in order to not be in the EU. Number two, Toyota. It's the world's largest car manufacturer, by which I mean the most cars. The manufacturer of the largest car was probably Cadillac in the mid-70s before the oil crisis. Those things were massive. Nonetheless, in 2016, we were all warned that Toyota would teach the UK a lesson by closing all of its UK factories and moving all of the jobs to places where the staff didn't vote for Brexit. In a surprise decision, though, Toyota recently completely affirmed their commitment to making money rather than squandering it for no reason other than politics and that they're going to continue manufacturing cars in Derbyshire for years to come. Not that you'd hear Victoria Derbyshire talk about it much in the beep. They're also going to be manufacturing Suzuki's hybrid car up there and investing money. The factory is actually in Edwina Curry's old constituency, so I therefore wonder if John Major ever visited it, you know, years before he was celebrating its potential closer to teach Leave voters a lesson. Number three, Nissan. It's another car maker, I repeat, I guess, but there's that expression about how those who fail to learn history are doomed to repeat it, not to be mistaken for those who fail to delete their internet history are doomed to have to explain it. Nissan Sunderland plant is massive. Every year it manufactures more cars in one factory than the whole of Italy. Nonetheless, a lot of people with relatives employed by the EU would rather that they closed it and relocated it to Italy so that the EU could justify an all-expenses paid trip to it. Alas, Neil Kinnock's relatives will have no such luck ever since Nissan recently announced that they're going to be instead closing their Barcelona factory and laying off 3,000 EU workers in order to expand their operations in northeast England. Number four, the other volume car manufacturer is Jaguar Land Rover, who are currently building a 3 million square foot distribution centre in Leicester, not the EU. You know, it's always nice when a story involving lots of money in Leicester doesn't turn out to be about Keith Vaz breaking the law. It's especially good when it's yet another story completely at odds with the narrative being spun by the likes of Vince Cable and Michael Heseltine. Number five, you know, one of the main criticisms thrown against Brexit at the time was from commentators who rubbished the idea that British train manufacturers could ever hope to succeed or do deals outside the EU, especially without EU politicians whining and dining the foreign buyers first, preferably with five-star accommodation thrown in. Despite this, one of the big stories to happen post-Brexit was Bombardier or Bombardier, I'm never sure how to pronounce it. Anyway, they won a two and a half billion pound contract to manufacture trains for Egypt's new monorail. The UK's other big train manufacturer, Hitachi, also announced that they're going to spend 400 million pounds improving their county Durham plant in order to expand post Brexit. You know, if that factory's in County Durham, they should probably send Dominic Cummings up there for the grand opening, just to annoy the Labour activists on Twitter. Number six. Finally, I thought I'd mention one of my favourites. You know, if the last few minutes were a meal, then this is a dessert in so much as it takes the cake for the biggest about face in British politics since the time that Nick Clegg switched his position from abolishing tuition fees to increasing them to nine grand. Up until now, we've just talked about private companies, but you would, I guess, generally assume that fair enough EU-funded bodies would relocate their operations back to the EU post-Brexit. It was therefore painful to the likes of Ian Blackford when the European Space Agency decided it was going to be spending hundreds of millions of euros building its new business incubation centre in England and not the EU. If Carolyn Lucas wasn't infuriated when she saw the carbon footprint of an Ariane 6 launch vehicle, she was probably incandescent with rage when she discovered that people designing it would no longer have the legal right to emigrate to Romania if they wanted, or be able to see their children run into an Olympic stadium proudly waving a blue flag covered in yellow stars. 
you know, it, it does make you wonder if the EU is all just a long-term ploy by Belgium to do well at the Olympics by claiming a shared European victory in the velodrome rather than earning six medals and watching Team GB come in the top five. Hashtag despite Brexit. Anyway, see you next week. If you like these, click subscribe.